Let's imagine that this happens. Some kind of global catastrophe, a doomsday event. Civilization has collapsed and the vast majority of humanity has died. But some survive. Let's say this TED lecture hall serves as some kind of hardened bunker. And, well, apart from you, you lot at the back, you die, but the rest of us survive. <laughs> and we venture outside and find ourselves in this post-apocalyptic wasteland. What now? What would you need to know? Not just to survive in the immediate aftermath, but to thrive in the long term? Could you rebuild a society for yourself and avoid another dark ages? Could you navigate some kind of shortcut route through the most important scientific discoveries and technologies and so accelerate the rebooting of civilization? Well, before we go any further, let me be absolutely clear. I do not actually believe doomsday is upon us. I'm not talking about survivalist skills or how the world might end. But I do think that this notion of the apocalypse and the loss of all that we take for granted today is a great thought experiment. The ultimate what if question. As a scientist, I wanted to hold up a mirror to our modern society and explore all of the behind the scenes fundamentals of how our world works and how we progressed through history. So imagine that we do find ourselves in this world where the rug has been pulled out from beneath our feet. Think of all the things that you rely upon for your day-to-day -day existence, food and clothes and tools and transport. How much of that do you think you could actually make or do for yourselves in a small community when civilization is no longer providing for you? Well, I think a very neat example of the problems that we would face here are given in an essay by Leonard Reed called Eye Pencil. Now, the Eye Pencil isn't some gadget coming out from Apple. It's a story. And it makes the point that this pencil, the simplest implement or tool that we're ever likely to use or interact with in our day-to-day -day lives, there is not a single person on the planet that knows how to make a pencil. No one person. Because human knowledge is distributed amongst the entire population, from operating a timber mill, or mining metal ore, or refining the fuel that we use to move things around. It takes many thousands of people to make a single pencil. And this is just a simple item of our everyday lives. As a society, we have an immense collective capability. But we're individually ignorant and incapable. So what would you need to know to start rebuilding a society from scratch and to relearn everything else that you'd need? Well, for this project, I researched into everything from making metal and clothes and reconstructing the calendar or the printing press or generating electricity, which have all been important in building our modern world. I don't really have time in 18 minutes to go into everything you would need to rebuild the world from scratch. So I'm going to focus on what I think to be the three most important areas that have allowed civilization to progress through history. And these have been food, fire, and knowledge. So starting with food, if you do find yourself in this thought experiment, in a post-apocalyptic uh, scenario, you could scavenge for leftovers. And I worked out that in the supermarket just down the road from where I live in North London, there is enough preserved food to keep me alive for 55 years. Or 63 years if I were happy to eat all the canned dog food and cat food as well. Today, we are exceedingly good at preserving and stockpiling food. But sooner or later, if, if you and future generations are going to survive, you've got to know how to grow food for yourselves. And most importantly, each farmer's got to be able to grow not just enough for themselves and their own family, but for several other members of society as well. 
because these people, freed from the fields, can then specialize in other skills, carpenters and blacksmiths and chemists and nurses. And it's this feat where one person feeds 10 others that enables civilizations to progress and develop over time. So let's look into the basics of how we've done that. Now today, only about a dozen crops account for over 80% of what we grow. And through the history of civilization, the most important plants have been these, the cereal crops. And in particular, the first three. He's gone backwards, not forwards. Let's try that again. Have been these, the cereal crops. And in particular, the first three, wheat, rice, and maize, which has supported all of the civilizations of Europe, Asia, and the Americas. And this dominance of cereals in our diets means that throughout the history of civilization, humanity has thrived by eating grass. No different from our cows and our sheep. Cereal crops evolved as fast-growing species of grass. But we had a problem. The kernel of wheat is a lovely nugget of nutrition, but it's hard and indigestible. So what we need to do is break down that grain to release the nutrition so that our bodies can absorb it. And the most important inventions that have helped here have been the Roman water wheel and the medieval windmill. These are clearly ways of harnessing natural energy sources to save the labor of our own muscles. And the most important part is a pair of cylindrical slabs, the millstones, which turn over each other and grind that grain into flour. This is a relic of Stone Age technology right in the heart of the complex mechanisms of the windmill. And we take that flour and we cook it. We bake bread. And the heat of the fire makes the food taste nice, but most importantly, it helps to break down the food so that we can absorb it. So in a very real sense, the millstones are like a technological extension of our own molar teeth. And the oven we use for cooking bread or the pot for boiling rice are like an external pre-digestive system. Humanity doesn't have the benefit of four stomachs like a cow, so we've had to adopt technology to enable us to thrive by eating fast-growing species of grass. So alongside food, fire is another foundation of society. We use fire to cook our food and to kill germs and meat and to keep us warm. But civilization also uses fire to take the base stuff that we dig out of the ground and transform it into the most useful materials and substances of history. We take river mud, clay, and we bake it into bricks for building. We use fire to get metal out of rock, out of the ore, and we use fire to drive much of the crucial chemistry that our society today depends on, like making artificial fertilizers which feed over two billion people on the planet today. Our modern world is as reliant upon fire as a Stone Age family huddled over the campfire. We've just hidden it behind the scenes in our factories and our power stations. Nowadays, of course, much of this energy comes from burning fossil fuels, coal, gas, and oil. But if we're starting over from scratch, we won't get access to crude oil. Now, something, uh, another energy source, something that is growing all around us, is trees. And for much of history, it has been firewood and charcoal which have provided the energy source for society. Now, what I want to show you is a very effective use of firewood. I've got what's called a gasifier stove here that I made myself out of just some old junk tin cans. There's an outer tin can and an inner can where I've got some newspaper and just a small handful of twigs, which I'm going to light in a second. And on the bottom of the outer can, there's a row of air holes and also underside of the inner can. So when this is lit, it draws the air up through the fire to keep it nice and intense. I'm just going to light that now.
So although it smokes a little as it first gets started, uh, this will clear in a second. And the unique thing about this gasifier stove is that, there you go, the smoke's just been stopped, and we now have a four-foot jet of flame coming out the top. So we get the camera to come in nice and close as I'm covering myself in some of that newspaper coming out as ash. I'm just going to take off this chimney. I'm being careful of your eyebrows there and the uh, TED camera, more importantly. You should be able to see that we've got these hot embers at the bottom of the tin can, but there are also jets of flame coming in from those air holes. And what's happening is that the wood is breaking down in the heat of the fire and giving off lots of gases and vapors and smoke, which is itself combustible. And we then reintroduce oxygen into that hot gas to then recombust all of that. This is smokeless when it's operating and very efficient. So I'm just going to douse that out now. And that's ready for clearing. Thank you. Now, this is exactly the kind of appropriate technology that is being touted around the developing world by development agencies, because it's simple to make yourself, and it makes the most efficient use of the firewood that a family can collect. And the fact that it's smokeless when it's up and running means it's much healthier for cooking in closed, cramped conditions. And power stations exist, which use that same gasification process on agricultural waste and, and biomass to generate electricity and provide heating. But that principle of baking wood to get it to drive off vapors has also been crucial in history. If you draw off those vapors rather than burning them, as we do in our gasifier stove, you can collect really useful substances for yourself, like pitch and turpentine and methanol. And even the ashes left behind after a hardwood fire are exceedingly useful. If you soak water through them, you can extract potash or soda ash if you burned seaweed. And potash and soda are used in making everything from soap to paper to glass. So before we used oil, it was wood that provided the fundamental chemistry for society. And today, we also use fire for moving things around. We burn fuel in our cars and our trucks. And what you really want to be able to avoid in this post-apocalyptic scenario is for your society to regress to a state like this, where you've lost mechanization, you can't run engines anymore, and you have to resort to using your own muscles or hitching up draft animals like horse and oxen. So the question is, how can you keep machinery going to provide power for you when you don't have access to oil. Well, you can take our gasifier stove, and if you scale it up from something the size of a soup can to something the size of a trash can and strap it to the back of a car, you can run a car using wood as fuel rather than oil. Now, this is the gasifier stove that we've got on the back, and it draws off those producer gases, takes them over the roof of the car, down into the engine, where they're finally allowed to mix with oxygen and explode usefully to drive the car. Now, sure, this might look like some kind of crazy steampunk post-apocalyptic Mad Max contraption, but it works. And this isn't some kind of fringe hobby. During the oil shortages of the Second World War, there were over a million gasifier-powered cars, wood-powered car wood cars across Europe. This is exactly the kind of technology that you could use to stop the further aggression of your society and then start pulling yourself back up by your own bootstraps. Now, finally, I want to focus much more on the long term. We've talked about how you can put food in your belly and harness fire for creating crucial chemistry and driving machinery for you. But there's something else just as important. How can you ensure that your society develops and progresses over the generations? How do you generate new knowledge for yourself and relearn everything else you need? Well, there's one invention that's over 400 years old 
and has been more important than any other in enabling us to build the modern world. And this invention is the scientific method. Now, it may sound a surprise to you, but the way that we do science today is itself an invention. It's like knowledge generation machinery. Science isn't a collection of facts and figures. It's the way you figure new things out for yourself. And in our history, the scientific revolution was driven and enabled by one particular substance, something which is relatively strong and also chemically unreactive and also perfectly transparent. And this substance is glass. Scientists like myself need glass to build the tools to investigate the natural world around us. We use glass to make test tubes that you can see inside to watch what happens in different chemical reactions. We use test tubes to make simple thermometers so you can measure and understand temperature and heat. And we use glass to manipulate light itself, to make lenses for telescopes or microscopes for studying germs and bacteria and infections. Now, the main ingredients for glass, there are three of them, are silica, soda or potash that we saw earlier, and lime. And you can get these from sand, seaweed, and seashells. You can collect for yourself all of the main ingredients you need for making glass from this idyllic Robinson Crusoe beach. And what you do is use fire to get a clay kiln nice and hot and pop inside your recipe. And the soda lowers the melting point of the silica sand so you can melt it into a mixture, and the lime helps to stabilize that for a good quality glass. So glass and science have been instrumental in enabling us to explore the natural world and understand it, and to build the technologies that we use in our modern world. And while an apocalypse is hopefully very unlikely, I still think this thought experiment of how you could go about rebooting civilization is very informative. So if you do ever find yourself in a post-apocalyptic world, remember this most important truth. It is science that built our modern world, and it is science you would need to build again from scratch. Thank you. Lewis, please come up. You've made a terrible mess. We have set fire to a lot of stuff. Well, thank you for not setting fire like to the stage. In my head. Actually, you need to. You need to come here. That's uh, put me right into my place. There, there we go. Thank you. There we go. That's much better. <laughs> well done. Um, so I was very taken. Actually, let's step forward because we have people coming to clean up, to hoover up behind you. Um, I was very taken with the, with the stat you gave us that it would take 55 years to eat everything in the supermarket. Please. Look, we're going to fall off the front here. Let's keep. Hello. <laughs> um, how on earth did you come up with the number 55 years? Or, or 63, if or, you eat all the yeah, candle food. To be fair, I'd, I'd rather top myself before yeah, reaching that I don't stage, I think. That. Um, so, for this project, um, I researched into lots of elements of how civilization works, but also how the stuff we've got already would provide a grace period that you could scavenge and use, like canned food that I talked about. And to calculate that number, I went around my local supermarket in North London, in Angel, and walked down every single aisle and multiplied up everything, all the sustained, all the preserved food that is there, and divided it down by the amount you need to eat per day to survive. And I got that number and also some very, very odd looks from the people <laughs> working in the supermarket with me and my clipboard counting stuff up. I'm sure you did. So you've written a book on the topic, the knowledge, and I feel like there are going to be many, many numbers in that too. Do you have any other beautiful numbers you'd like to share with us? Oh, so the, the other things I looked into was, was how long pharmaceuticals would continue to remain uh, useful if, if they're not being produced anymore and you want to continue to take right. antibiotics, for right. example. But the thing that really stood out to me as interesting um, was how long GPS keeps going. How long could you pinpoint your position on the planet before you had to work out navigation for yourself because the satellites aren't working? And, how long do we have and it ends up being pretty quick. 
Because though the GPS satellites will still be up there in their orbits, they require regular updates for the timing signal, right. which is how GPS works. GPS works by a very accurate clock, and they will start falling out of synchronicity with each other. Oh, how sad. So get out your sextant. Right. <laughs> I shall. Thank you so much. Thank thanks, you, Anna. Thanks, Cheers. Lewis.